my name's David Stevens, and I do research in oceans and their impact on the climate system at the University of East Anglia. But I guess as a scientist, I like to do controlled experiments. So you maybe change something and see how it responds, but you need a control case. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a control case. You know, we've only got the one planet, and yet we are performing an experiment. And I guess m modelling is pretty much our only chance of trying to predict what might happen or understand what, what we are doing to the planet. A climate model is a mathematical description of the components of the climate system, so the ocean, the atmosphere, the cryosphere. And we, we use equations to represent those components, and essentially we just solve those equations. And it, I, I do find it amazing that you can set up a, a mathematical model of the Earth and essentially do nothing but shine the sun on it, and it produces a climate not unlike what we see um, if we go out and take measurements. The, the fundamental equations we use, I guess, go back to Newton's uh, second law of motion. So if you consider a parcel of fluid in the atmosphere or in the ocean, then there will be forces on that fl parcel of fluid, and those forces will induce an acceleration. And that gives that parcel of fluid um, a motion. And we can essentially solve for many, many millions of parcels of fluid all around the Earth and compute the winds in the atmosphere and currents in the ocean. My main interests are in the ocean and the ocean's role on the climate system. So I very much focus on trying to improve and understand the ocean component of climate models. The full models themselves are really, really complex and understanding them is not really the kind of thing that a single person can do in isolation. So climate modelling tends to be a team type activity. There might be a group working on the ocean group working on the atmosphere, but then they'll come together and uh, help build a single model of the, the entire system and then work together in terms of analysing the results because the components are all interacting with one another. Let's start by just talking about what, why you might even study the ocean. It's really important because of its enormous capacity to store heat. One of the, my favourite um, factoids for telling people uh, about the ocean is the top few metres of the ocean have got the same heat storage capacity as the entire atmosphere above. So there's you know, an enormous potential for storing heat or taking heat out of the atmosphere or releasing heat back to the atmosphere. So uh, the ocean isn't a single monolithic slab of water. If you go to, say, the tropics, the waters at the surface can be around about 30 degrees Celsius. And yet, if you go down to the, the depths at, say, four or five kilometres, um, the waters can be, say, two degrees Celsius. So there's an enormous um, differential in heat between the surface ocean and the deep ocean. So that leads to possibly the question of why is the water so cold at the tropics? Um, in the deep waters, and where does that cold water come from? And it doesn't take too much thought to think, well, actually, it, it must have come from somewhere cold. And there are movements in the ocean right down to the, the deepest parts of the water column, which are transporting uh, waters from the poles, where water tends to sink, gets very dense and sinks to the sea floor and then spreads out throughout the world's oceans. And this transfer of cold water towards the warmer regions, the equatorial regions, and the associated warm water flowing from the, at the surface from the tropics towards the poles um, provides a heat transport. So the ocean is transferring heat from the equatorial latitudes to the uh, polar latitudes. So this flow of um, warm water at the surface towards the poles and colder water 
at depth towards the equator produces a transfer of heat from the equator towards the poles. And it's this transfer of heat plays an important role in keeping our planet at the temperature and the regions of our planet at the temperatures that we um, live in. I'm, I'm not talking at all about global warming here, I'm just um, how the climate system maintains itself in a fairly um, equilibrium state. I mean, there are some, there is some variability on top of this, but the basic mean state is set by some of these processes. People have, um, for many years, thought about what would happen if this overturning circulation we, we talked about earlier, um, particularly the, in, within the Atlantic, shut down. That transports an, aw an awful amount of heat northwards towards uh, the high latitudes in Europe. Um, there's been less focus on the Southern Oceans and yet there is an overturning circulation associated with the um, Southern Ocean and the waters around Antarctica. And it often seems very remote. And we thought, what would happen if that shut down? Would it have an impact? And, and how global would the impact be felt? So we, we did some ex similar experiments where we released you know, a significant amount of fresh water in the Southern Oceans to mimic um, carving or melting of the um, ice sheets to look at the uh, Im impact that might have on the um, planet as a whole. And there were some su surprising findings right, right through to Im impacts in the northern hemisphere. So, you know, the Antarctic being a long way away doesn't mean to say you can ignore it. And the pro any problems that might occur there are not our problem because, you know, they potentially might be. I guess probably the key question at the moment is how will the ocean respond in a changing climate? Um, will it um, reduce the impacts of um, the global change we're seeing? Or is it reducing the impacts of the global change? What are the potential feedbacks? Could some regions see a faster change in climate, some, some regions slower. We already know that the Arctic um, sees a much more amplified response to global warming than, say, the tropics. There, there are a number of ways of going out into the ocean and measuring the, the heat of the ocean, the temperature of the ocean. So the traditional method was to go along in a ship and then lower an instrument from the surface down to the sea floor and make a profile measurement of temperature. That's very expensive, both in terms of people and monetary costs. Ship time is tens of thousands of UK pounds per day. And then you have to you know, man it and have you know, trained scientists operating the instruments. More, more recently, there's been a huge increase in the number of profiles of temperature in the ocean from something called the Argo network. So Argo is a network of floats, and they do something rather odd for a float in that they sink. So they uh, start at the surface and will sink to a depth of about 2,000 meters. And then they uh, move along with the ocean currents. And after 10 days or so, they can pop up to the surface. And when they're coming up to the surface again, they're measuring temperature and they speak through the um, a satellite um, communications network um, and deliver their um, temperature data they've recorded and then sink back down to the depth again and then travel along and there's about 3,000 of these in the world oceans and it's produced a real step change in the number of measurements we have of um, temperature profiles. Pre and post Argo is just the is really kind of start the contrast. Uh, so uh, the, the the temperature data we collect from the uh, um, both ships and from the uh, the Argo program are useful to help us start off our forecasts of the climate system and in particular the ocean component. So 
to, to start a forecast, we need to know the state of the system at one particular time. And back in the 60s, we had very few measurements of vast um, swathes of the ocean where there were literally no measurements had ever been taken. Whereas since about 2005, there are measurements throughout the world's oceans. Pretty much everywhere there are very few regions, possibly just the polar regions, where measurements are sparse. So we use this, this data to provide some starting point for our forecasts, and that's called initialization. Initialized forecasts um, of ocean conditions have certainly got a much better chance of uh, being more accurate now, um, where we have all this data compared to the 60s. I originally trained as a mathematician, and in my third year I did a course on mathematical modelling of the oceans. It was very theoretical and you looked at very idealised models, so oceans were square basins and it was really focusing in on processes. And I found that really, really interesting, so I went on and did a PhD in mathematical modelling of the oceans, but the models became more complex and more realistic. And eventually that um, led me to talking to uh, observational oceanographers. And I guess in the late 80s, early 90s, was a time when the, the models of the ocean were just getting realistic enough for observational oceanographers to really start to believe them and possibly even use them in planning their observational campaigns. And so I started to work with a, one of the observational oceanographers here and actually even went to sea a few times, which was really, well, one, exciting, but two, seeing the measurements actually collected at first hand, you know, really gives you uh, I think a much greater insight into what's going on within the ocean and also an appreciation of what you're doing in terms of the modelling. The, the, this um, research cruise, uh, and they're called cruises, um, although cruises. <laughs> they're not, nece not necessarily uh, you know, a, a holiday, um, but it was to the Antarctic and to the Southern Ocean, taking measurements in the Southern Ocean. It's about two months long, but really enjoyable and really productive. So I joined the ship in the Falkland Islands and then we sailed down to um, the Antarctic continent and then from there took measurements all the way up through the Atlantic to um, just off of Brazil, so just near Rio de Janeiro. Well it really was you know, mesmerising, it I mean, it's absolutely beautiful, pristine. The wildlife is just incredible. And, you know, we should make sure we shouldn't damage it either. <laughs> I think it's just a case of being in, in, trying to engage and be open and be honest. And I, I do try and um, get out and engage with the pub, public. So you know, I go into schools and you know, I try and give public lectures um, when there's good opportunities. So most recently I did one to uh, a group of old age pensioners in Norfolk in, in uh, July. So, but again, it was, you know they were all really interested, really engaged, and it's good fun. You know, I, I really do enjoy trying to put over some of the science.